Hello, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. My name is Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. How are you doing today? We hope you guys are having a wonderful Sunday. And thank you for sharing part of your Sunday with us. So we've got a great show for you. And I'm going to hand it over to Donya for the introductions. Yes, we do. So I know you, you guys see this very handsome man sitting on the uh, on the screen with us. His name I'm is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just telling the truth. Um, well, his name is Charles, Trooper Charles Williams. And Trooper Williams is a volunteer at the Buffalo Soldier National Museum. 2006. He is also known as the major. So we're going to go into that to find out why that is. But Trooper Williams attended um, and graduated from my school's, uh, one of my school's, um, what do you call it? Because I went to Jackson oh, State. Oh, yes. Swag. <laughs> yes. Swag, swag, baby. <laughs> so, um, yes, Trooper Williams is, is attended and graduated from Prairie View A&M, and he received a BS in biology and was commissioned into the Army as a second lieutenant. Uh, he's received an honorable discharge from the Army at the rank of major. So I just just wanted to say thank you for joining us. This is going to be a very exciting show. And I'm just, just excited to learn about the Buffalo Soldiers and share the stories that you can tell us for Black History. Outstanding. History. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yes, especially as a, um, right before we went live chatting about, because like you said, you're in Houston, we were chatting about the weather in Texas, so just happy to hear that you weren't so badly, badly affected despite the, the deep freeze in Houston. So again, just really appreciative that you could um, join us today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so I guess we should talk about a little bit about the origin story of the Buffalo Soldiers, kind of how they came into being. So. My understanding is they were kind of an, an offshoot or they came out of the, the US colored troops. Is that correct? <laughs> well, yes, uh, well, partially. Uh, we, we, can't, um, we can't really discuss the Buffalo Soldiers while, you know, without mentioning uh, the United States colored troops and who they were because, uh, because of the, the job that they did um, I think that changed a lot of attitudes among how uh, black soldiers would perform in the field. Uh, in 1863, um, uh, President Lincoln uh, decided to uh, create the United States Colored Troops. And the US Colored Troop would consist of 178 regiments during that time period. They would incur a um, an enlistment period of, I think it was about three years during that time. <clears throat> and they started off making uh, about $10, $10 a month and they uh, decided uh, that they should protest and eventually they brought the, the same salaries up to the black soldiers, <clears throat> which was about $13 a month. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now, the, the U.S. Uh, colored troops didn't come into being until uh, President Lincoln decided to uh, issue an executive order, better known as the Emancipation Proclamation of Emancipation. Uh, emancipation. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> um, at that point, um, you know, it would have been dangerous for uh, slaves to leave the plantation. They probably would have been shot. So the devil was in the detail with the executive order. Uh, sections, uh, I think it's nine and 10, clearly instruct the, the slaves not to leave the plantation until federal troops arrive in the area. <clears throat> and uh, so, <clears throat> so, but after that, then um, let's fast forward to April, 1865, uh, when General Lee, uh, surrendered in Appomattox. 
Well, there were several regiments, African-American regiments, who witnessed that, you know, that entire event. In fact, uh, they were really dogging uh, General Lee all that day <laughs> uh, and had been for most of the week. Uh, and so it was, you know, it was, uh, they were there. They were fighting for their freedom. <clears throat> uh, after General Lee uh, surrendered, <clears throat> um, you know, Texas uh, decided that they weren't ready to quite surrender. And so uh, General Grant decided that they had never been occupied. So why don't we just send some troops around uh, the peninsula of Florida into the, uh, the Gulf Coast area and land them uh, some around in the Rio Grande area. <clears throat> and then they can't say they, they weren't occupied. <clears throat> and that did happen. <laughs> Um, so, um, the, uh, what's interesting, um, we had difficulty in trying to determine, um, which troops were available in, in, uh, Galveston, Texas, um, doing the reading of the general order number three, uh, which is, um, the announcement that slaves were free in, in Texas. <clears throat> and that was General Hall Granger who did that. We later discovered about three or four months ago, we discovered the name of, uh, of the actual regiment, the black regiment that was, was there. It was the 29th Illinois. And, uh, and, and they celebrate uh, that event. <clears throat> uh, so now everybody is, you know, everybody is free and, and Congress decided to reorganize the military. And they did so they were coming from a wartime uh, situation to a peacetime. And <clears throat> they ordered the military to establish six all black regiments. And the military responded by designating uh, uh, two cavalry units, the 9th and the 10th, and four uh, infantry regiments, which two years later, they consolidated into the 24th and the 25th infantry regiments. <clears throat> so those were formed uh, uh, one year after the Civil War had concluded, 1866, we're talking about. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so had it not been for the type of performance that the U.S. colored troops uh, performed at and the level that they performed at. Uh, who can say if the military would have wanted the, you know, the black soldier in there because they had to prove everything. They nothing was given to them. They had to prove themselves every day of the of the year. <clears throat> but they did it in spite of that, uh, of the hardships and the obstacles that were placed in front of them, and they actually performed outstandingly. Yeah. Well, it's going to actually be my, my follow-up question, because I, I was very curious, because the African-American men in the USCT had already kind of established their fighting reputation, especially there was a, the ba famous battle um, in Richmond, where they, um, they had broken through the Confederate lines and you know, really had earned respect. And I, I was just wondering if the achievements that they had, that they won in the Civil War would have transferred over into I guess their their careers as Buffalo soldiers, but you're kind of telling me the um, the prejudices against them about black men serving serving in the military still kind of why do you think it still follows them like that? Well, uh, for some reason, um, every since the the first the, the Revolutionary War and the origin of the country. Um, Blacks have fought in each and every battle. Um, I mean, everyone. There's not one that we we haven't fought in. And we have a favorite saying at the museum: "We were always there. We were always there." You can go back to the American Revolutionary War. The first American to be killed was Christmas Adams. He was an African American uh, sailor uh, who was who was fatally killed. He was the first one. So the first person to die for freedom of the country was a was a black man. 
Christmas wow. animals. <laughs> but um, um, what the there are um, there's a movie uh, Glory. Um, I don't know if you've probably seen it. It mm -hmm. features um, the story about the 54 Massachusetts. Incidentally, we have their casual casualty list by name uh, at the museum. Um, but uh, they perform so outstandingly well that all of the newspapers picked up that uh, you know that charge and how valiant they were, and they died. And but they still you know, continued the assault. Uh, the white soldiers who witnessed it, they, they developed immediate respect for them after that. And uh, so if that was quite gratifying to, to know that they, they earned a degree of respect and was recognized by the military because had they not, uh, I don't think they would have the opportunity uh, to serve because see, prior to, uh, prior to the the Civil War, they could fight in battles, but after the battle was over with, they had to pack up their things and go back home. Uh, all of that changed in 1866 when Congress uh, reorganized the military. <clears throat> so I'm kind of curious where these men were coming from across the, were they coming more from one part of the United States than another, or were they kind of coming from all over the, I guess the, the East Coast by that point? Actually, um, the the Buffalo soldier or the black soldier came from primarily ranks of, of, of slaves. How, uh, but you also had a lot of free men of color at that time, too. Uh, we saw that uh, from our research, we noticed that uh, there were quite a few recruits uh, who enlisted from you know the Washington area, um, right, Kentucky, right. Tennessee. Uh, not to mention, you know, if they could get away in the South, they, they would join. Um, so, and they came from all over the, all over the, the country, uh, actually. And I guess the, one of the most obvious questions to ask, I've heard lots of stories about how they got the name Buffalo Soldier. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's the number one question. In fact, there are a few things that, that we want uh, individuals to know who visit the, the museum. We want them to know uh, about four things about the Buffalo Soldier. Uh, one is uh, uh, the, the year they were formed, 1866. Um, we want them to know the, the four historical units, the 9th and 10th Cavalry. They were regiment size units and the 24th and the 25th Infantry Regiment. We want people to know that. <clears throat> and we want them to know how they got the nickname Buffalo Soldier. Well, the name came from, uh, in 1867, the 10th Cavalry was skirmishing up on the High Plains with the, with the Cheyenne. The Cheyenne were, were known as the Lords of the High Plains. Uh, they were excellent warriors and, and, and outstanding horsemen. <clears throat> but they encountered the 10th Cavalry. And the 10th Cavalry gave them everything that they could handle. Mm -hmm. And so they dubbed the 10th Cavalry as Wild Buffalo. That was the actual translation, Wild Buffalo. Wow. <laughs> then generically, as the name became more popular, uh, it, you know, it applied to every African-American soldier during that time period because the Buffalo soldier period would run concurrent with segregation of the military. So the, I guess the nickname that the, that the indigenous people gave them wild buffalo, was that a mark of respect about the, the fierceness that they're fighting or what, what was behind that nickname? You're absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, the name was given to them uh, out of respect for the fierce fighting uh, ability. Um, their fighting spirit remind them, reminded them of the spirit of the buffalo. And um, and there, and some uh, you know some African American males had curly hair, and the hair reminded them of the oh, man right. between the, the the you know the two horn the antlers the oh, horns of the uh, they call that the sacred mane I think that's what the Indians referred to that as being but uh, and and primarily it was based on the fighting you know, their fighting spirit. 
So do I have this correct? So the people who were supposed to be their enemies seem to have had more respect for them than their white countrymen. Do I have that right? Well, yeah, there are controversies now um, regarding uh, the name, um, but we feel that uh, the Cheyenne is a good representation of how they felt about uh, encountering uh, the black cavalrymen. Uh, we, we, um, we documented a letter from, um, from a, uh, the wife of a cavalry officer. I think he was stationed at, at Fort Raleigh in the, 18, the late 1870s. <clears throat> and she writes home to her family describing the, the soldiers uh, that her husband commands. And uh, and she described them as little monkeys, but this but the oh, hanging on a horseback. But the Indians referred to them as buffalo soldiers, and uh, and I think that was around 1870. Uh, but there's controversy regarding uh, if if the every Native American uh, agreed with that name, and um, and and for a while that that, that was time a time when uh, black soldiers probably, you know, didn't warm up to that name at, until they understood, you know, how, how uh, Indians name things, you know, they compare everything to nature practically. And they saw the, the black man out there and you know, it reminded him of the Buffalo. So wow. it's how it came about. Mm -hmm. So, so given the fact that this I love is, history, is, <laughs> <laughs> I do too. Do we? <laughs> we all do. Um, given the fact that this is Black History Month, what about the Buffalo Soldiers would you think that everybody really needs to know? I want to get that out right off the, off the top. <laughs> I think everyone needs to know that the Buffalo Soldiers were very much aware of what they accomplish or fail to accomplish would some way impact the rest of the, uh, of the black population. And, uh, and they had several mottos. The Van Camry, for example, was, uh, uh, let's see, what was it? Um, ready and forward. And, oh, that's a 10th cavalry, ready and forward. Uh, and the 9th cavalry was, we can, we will. And, uh, when, and they tried to live up to those mottos. And uh, you could even say that um, they were so good uh, out on the Western frontier uh, that uh, no one, you know, you could actually call them a special force. Uh, they spent more time in the American West than any other military unit, those, you know, historical units. They, um, they stayed out there for two and a half decades uh, trying to uh, meet their, their primary mission was to protect settlers moving west. And uh, so when you hear the term manifest destiny and all that, uh, you could say the Buffalo Soldier are very much a part of that because uh, a lot of historians have said uh, a lot of white historians have also acknowledged that it would have taken 50 years uh, for them to settle the West had it not been for the job that the Buffalo Soldiers did. They did a variety of different jobs, uh, just not fight doing uh, Native Americans during the Indian Wars. But there are a lot of other duties that they, uh, they performed as well. Wow. I just, I just learned something new. I had no idea that they were, that they were protecting pioneers. Of it. I'm curious what the pioneers must have made to them, considering all the kind of anti-black propaganda that they would have heard growing up. So that you know, the, the meeting of the two must have been very interesting. Um, the uh, we have accounts from um, you know from each one of those the the uh, those units that in the areas where they operated at, um, they were very very well known. They knew that they were were there. <clears throat> uh, some, some towns were pleased to see them and some towns didn't want them anywhere in, you know, in their businesses anywhere. And uh, so typically when they would uh, arrive at a town to read a town of outlaws, uh, 
such as Billy the Kid, <laughs> those kind of people, mm -hmm. um, they would uh, in camp or bivouac on the edge of town. And uh, people were always curious about it, but you can imagine seeing a, a, a large number of soldiers and they're all black and they're riding proud and looking tough. And they were <laughs> <laughs> really tough. <laughs> they, uh, they have more campaigns than any other cavalry unit in the military during that time. They were known uh, as the best horsemen in the military. In fact, West Point, they were 100, 100 Buffalo soldiers from the 9th and the 10th Cavalry were rotated each year to West Point to teach cavalry drills and horsemanship skills. And the place where they did that at West Point is called Buffalo Soldier Field. It is still there. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It just so, so the army recognized their work. They they recognized their work. Uh, That's awesome. It's just amazing that they're like one of the least known military units, you know, in terms of American military history. That I I certainly never learned about them in school. Let's just put it that way. They, they were never. Well, mentioned. Nor did I. And, I uh, mean, but the thing is, is that this is even more um, fascinating because. They recognized them throughout the army. It, it sounds like, I mean, throughout the military, they recognized what they did, how they did it, yet they didn't share it. That's right. Which, they didn't, they you didn't know, share it. Yeah, it, they, they didn't share the information about them, what they did, but they could not not say, we wouldn't be here without this. We wouldn't be there without that. We did, they did these things. They taught our white counterpart they taught mm -hmm. our white counterparts how to do certain things at this particular field horsemen and other stuff that they had to do they actually taught them but you do not get that credit in the books no you don't but they give no. that credit mm -hmm. military wise yeah look how long it took uh for the information the story to get out about the tuskegee airmen now the tuskegee yeah. airmen uh, they stood on the soldiers of the of the shoulders of the Buffalo soldiers. Uh, the, uh, all of the units uh, that came after the Buffalo soldier, you, you could say that they stood on their shoulders because um, they performed very, very well in the field during the period that they were out there. Um, it's just some of the things that happened to them is just, you would think that they would have uh, been more, uh, progressive in reporting the accomplishments that, but it wasn't like that at all. Even though we have between the ages, uh, the years of 18, let's see, 1867 to 18, the early 1890s, uh, Buffalo soldiers had earned uh, approximately 16 Medal of Honor. Mm. Uh, so you, you can see that they were being recognized by their commanders. But, um, but if you spend two and a half decades out in the field, <laughs> you get, you can, you'll get quite good at what you're doing. <laughs> but again, I just think that. they had the highest, the highest uh, morale of any of the cavalry units. They had the highest enlistment rate. And they, uh, they had the lowest desertion rate of any of the cavalry. That includes the white ones, too. <laughs> I mean, I'm just shaking my head because I remember learning about Manifest Destiny and the migration to the West and the settlements of you know, that part of the country. We even had a blank map where we had to draw in those, those routes, those, those trails that are going from East to West. Never mentioned anything about Buffalo soldiers being there. <laughs> action force or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about their living conditions. Because um, I have a, a, an ancestral uncle mm -hmm. who was a Buffalo soldier and he served in Fort Grant in the Arizona Territory. Right. You know, I've seen those pictures and I've seen the contemporary pictures of the fort where he, where he lived and worked. He was a cook, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it looked rough. It looked mm -hmm. really rough. Like, you know, obviously nothing was paved. There was no sidewalks. It was all muddy and dirty and kind of shack-like looking buildings. 
I mean, was that kind of typical of a, of a fort of that period? No, that's about, <laughs> that's a, probably an accurate description of a fort. Uh, now in Texas, we're fortunate. We have several frontier uh, forts that we can visit and to get a good idea of how it must have been for uh, soldiers, cavalry soldiers, or any soldier during that period. Um, and the 13, uh, the 13 uh, forts <clears throat> uh, in Texas, it's at least 13. Uh, but actually in the state of Texas, there were two fort lines. One was pre-Civil War and then the second fort line was was post Civil War, you know, for the because of the Indian period. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but uh, the my favorite fort is way out in West Texas, called uh, Fort Davis, and uh, that fort was occupied by um, by African American soldiers. Uh, the Ninth Cavalry were the first ones out of that group to go to Texas. And their mission was to protect the old San Antonio El Paso Road. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Texas and made to drive from San Antonio to El Paso. Let me tell you, it is a jump. <laughs> wow. Uh, it may take a month by, you know, by maybe a couple months by wagon uh, mm -hmm. just to get from San Antonio to, uh, to Fort Davis because it's way out in Fort West Texas. And there is nothing out there but the great uh, Comanche War Trail. And that's why it was there. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but to answer your, your question, Brian, yeah, it, it was uh, dirty. It was hard. Um, but, you know, they, they were professional soldiers and they took pride in what they did. <clears throat> and they got better, too. Uh, of course, you... You know the story about uh, blacks not being able to read, uh, you know, uh, being allowed to learn to read. Uh, and the military realized that, that was a strong possibility that their soldiers would not be able to read or write. Uh, so they did, the military did something different. They decided to assign chaplains uh, to each one of those four units. Now, the job of the chaplains were not only to administer to their spiritual needs, but also to teach them how to read, write, and do math, simple math. <clears throat> and uh, the one of my favorite uh, of those chaplains was one with the, the 24th Infantry. His name was Allen Allensworth. Uh, Colonel Allensworth, uh, was one of the, the higher ranking officers uh, that were African-American. <clears throat> and he created a lesson plan and a curriculum to teach black soldiers and their dependents how to read, write, and do math. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the military, <clears throat> uh, after a while, they recognized his work and they adopted his lesson plan and curriculum mm -hmm. as the military's uh, educational plan for enlisted soldiers. Wow. So uh, Alan's work was one of my favorites because he did all of that. <clears throat> but after they they learned to read, write, and they were eager to do it, um, performance improved. They could write reports. Uh, I have to give the white officers a great uh, deal of um, you know of credit because. Typically, they were the ones to, to make sure that uh, the enlisted men were, you know, uh, doing their homework and, and continuing their studies, even when they were in the field. And they even resorted to teaching, too. So before we move on to the museum, I do have, I was hoping you could talk, spend a little, just a little time talking about the unexpected link between Buffalo soldier, soldiers and Colonel Custard. Because that, that's, that's just a mad story. <laughs> now, I think that is an interesting story. Um, it's it, when the military decided to form these, these all black units, uh, they tried to um, select, they tried to screen the officers that they, they wanted to, to lead these particular men. 
And, uh, and one of the first officers that they approached was General Custer at that time as a general. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he turned down the, uh, he, he turned down the, the opportunity. Um, let me go back. He was an, he was a general during the Civil War, but when they re, reorganized, he was, you know, he was a colonel. He had been bumped down to a colonel. But, and that was pretty common back then during that time period. Uh, but he, he, he decided he, uh, he would not accept the command of the 9th Cavalry uh, as offered to him. They offered him a bonus and, and everything else, a promotion, everything to, to get him to do it. But he, he insisted that he didn't feel that black soldiers would make good cavalrymen. And, and, and which was not unusual during the day. Let's think about this. It was the 1800s, um, you know, the 19th century. The attitudes were, were you know, still racist, real raw. <clears throat> and many of the soldiers uh, that commanded them, did, you know, they had those, those type of attitudes or those sentiments. Um, but nevertheless, you know, they persevered and, uh, you know, and, and perform uh, outstandingly. Now, it's not to say they didn't have problems along the way. They had quite a few. Um, but <clears throat> in the Battle of the Little Bighorn, uh, we know that there was not a single Buffalo soldier among those soldiers who died uh, during that massacre uh, that, you know, that took out Custer's entire regiment. <clears throat> um, but later on, a few years after that, um, they, the Southern Cavalry would get in trouble again. <laughs> and uh, the closest uh, help they could, they could get was from the 9th Cavalry, the one that they turned down, the one that he turned down uh, years before. But they rode all night. They covered a lot of miles. And, and they made it there to, to save those those troopers of the 7th Regiment, 7th Cavalry Regiment. And, uh, but the, uh, you know, Buffalo soldiers knew that, uh, that they had dodged the bullet when they heard about the little big horn and what happened to, uh, to Custer. <laughs> so I, ha I have a um, question that I wanted to ask because you seem to be, telling us a pattern of the military and it's something that I've actually heard about the military and that was they were making strides as far as racism and integrating was concerned well before America as a whole was mm -hmm. doing it so yeah I mean why but you say that you can why say pause that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah why pause or break you know with doing all of this, making all of these, you know, strides, because I mean, they were teaching, they were, you know, they made sure that they could read, they made sure they could write, they made sure they um, could do reports like they were supposed to. And in turn, we turned around and, and we were teaching them in certain instances. So it was, it was a, it was a give and take lifestyle. It sounds like, however, they didn't share that outside. No, no. And it, those soldiers, the black soldiers uh, who joined the cavalry, um, you know, they got most of them got a taste of it when they were, um, you know, what they were assigned to the USCT. Uh, quite a few of those soldiers, they were vets by that time. Uh, they came over to join the ranks of the Buffalo soldiers. So, um, you know, they got quite a bit of experience. Uh, I think one of the big problems that they encountered uh, when we talk about the officers. The first, uh, the first officers to command the Buffalo Soldier units were white. Uh, we wouldn't get a, um, a, a black officer until 11 years later, and that would have been uh, Henry O. Flipper, uh, the first uh, African American to graduate from uh, West Point in the 19th century. And then he was followed by uh, Alexander, uh, and and then another officer, black officer, uh, his name was Charles Young. Charles Young was probably the most celebrated of those. 
and <clears throat> he went on to command the 9th Cavalry Regiment. <clears throat> and he, he also became the first park superintendent uh, of a national parks because the military assigned uh, several of the cavalry units, uh, most notably uh, the 9th Cavalry was assigned to uh, take care of Yosemite Park and Sequoia. <clears throat> And, and both of those folks are in California. So there are accomplishments that you would not believe. Um, and that's where our museum comes into play um, when we're trying to locate stories, we hear about them, we investigate them, we, we try and research them and, and we will build, if we can, we'll build exhibits. Um, as soon as we get enough information about it. Uh, we, we, need to get into, we definitely need to get into the museum because as you're talking and everything, we've had several people that have given their, has already stated how they know that they have ancestors who were Buffalo soldiers. One actually gave, um, well, a couple of them have given names and they, you know, 10th, talking about the 10th regiment i think she said his name was sergeant benjamin brand or mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to scroll it back but she's a she's a descendant of his and there's several so yeah go ahead brian let's talk about the museum <laughs> <laughs> i don't love to talk about the museum it's a beautiful um it's a beautiful building you guys should see it and um we want you to come down and experience it for yourself that was a very nice segue, because I, I wasn't aware that you guys did that kind of that kind of research. But obviously, if you're doing exhibits, um, you would do. So what are some of the topics that you, you touch on in your exhibitions? Well, um, we, we will, I'll give you, a, we have three galleries, basically. <clears throat> uh, we feature uh, artifacts. We have about 4,500 uh, various artifacts uh, that we can place in exhibit. We have about five Connex containers of uh, just artifacts that we've collected over the years. Uh, we don't turn away anything. If, if someone does donate to us an artifact or item from an, an from an ancestor, a Buffalo Soldier ancestor, we're going to keep it. We're not getting rid of it. <laughs> um, so that's one of the ways we we're able to uh, build a lot of exhibits just from simply don donations. And once people find out that there's a place that they can send uh, something, you know, like, you know, like an artifact from an ancestor, uh, there most people are willing to do it because they know they'll get a chance to go and see it displayed one day. So, uh, and that's a gratifying feeling. I, in fact, I have. Uh, my family donated a picture to, um, uh, to the museum uh, featuring my great uncle uh, who served in France. <clears throat> and in the picture, this inset of Emmy J. Scott, uh, who was the, uh, the first special assistant to the Secretary of War. And then uh, also in that same picture frame, it's a black commander uh, who uh, his name is Dennison, who commanded a National Guard unit in Chicago, Illinois. So <clears throat> it's quite, quite interesting, I think. Is that true? Yeah. I've, I've, I've been researching someone for the Library of Congress who was a Buffalo soldier, and he was working mm -hmm. up in Montana. So, I mean, the, the range that they were working in was incredible. But that, oh, yes, I'm telling you, it, uh, it's amazing. Um, we were in 2010, we were invited uh, to, um, to attend a commemoration of the Big Burn. And the Big Burn was about the, uh, the huge wildfire, forest fire that impacted Idaho and parts of Montana, um, burned off uh, you know, property the size of Connecticut, the state of Connecticut. Wow. Uh, and they said, they said and they've had, they haven't had a worse of fire fire. Uh, fire fight of uh, uh, fire that way um, in in ever in, in and that's saying a lot 
when we consider the the fires that you know the strike up in 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 California on the West Coast. Uh, but this thing was really uh, historical in nature. Um, they sent the elements of the 25th in there from Missoula, and and another group came from um, Fort Wash Fort Wright. Uh, in Washington state. And essentially, uh, they saved the town of Wallace, Idaho, and the town of Avery, Idaho. And, uh, and it, it was written about, and they, uh, there's a docu-film. We, we contributed to that film, incidentally, too. Wow. <clears throat> it was a lot of fun doing it. Um, but if you visit that area, you can actually see the burn lines that's still there from over a hundred years ago. Wow. It's quite impressive. <laughs> but, uh, but they wanted to recognize the Buffalo soldiers and they invited, uh, they, they, they decided, let's contact the, the Buffalo Soldier Museum and see if they can send us some guys uh, up here uh, to participate in this ceremony. <laughs> and we, of course, we were glad to go. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've enjoyed a lot of experiences since I've retired and uh, with this museum, it's a lot of fun. <clears throat> we do a yeah. lot of interesting things for the community. So because we are um, also a genealogy show and people will be curious about records. So the bulk yep. of the records are actually held by the, the National Archives in DC. And then there's another tranche of records that are held by its annex in College Park in Maryland. Do you, does um, the museum have records or copies of the reports or any kind of documents relating to them? We, uh, most of the, the documents that we uh, would would uh, come in, uh, into possession of will probably come from the archives. At, um, we, uh, not to mention, we get copies from and share information from other museums too. Uh, so that's another resource. Um, we had, and I recall reading um, an account of, um, of uh, Henry O. Flipper, the first uh, African-American to graduate from West Point, he was interviewed by a reporter in New York. And we we had a copy of that. I don't know why, I forget how we got that. <laughs> but it was an interesting interview because he wanted a question, he asked him, he said, do you expect that the white soldiers will uh, obey you? If, you know, you're a black officer? And he said, yes. And uh, and he, he believed that. And um, although we, I, I don't think that ever happened, but <clears throat> but uh, I thought that was striking uh, answer to the question when it was right. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of our uh, one of our one of our people have a question about that is in the records. Um, talking about research, she Rita Shipman says, as much as I love to research in person. What are some of the best online sites to research ancestors who were Buffalo soldiers? Um, well, of course, you, the National Archives is a good place to start because you can request uh, their military records. You can request their civil service record. Uh, you can request uh, their medical records, um, their selective uh, service board because every you know once mail got to be eighteen he had to register, <clears throat> so they they did that then as well. Uh, so all those records you can you can obtain <clears throat> from the archives. There was a fire uh, there, oh, I think in the nineteen uh, seventies somewhere in there, and a lot of the records were destroyed. They were burned. Uh, in fact. Uh, I re retrieved a record from one of my ancestors and you could tell the edges of the document was burned. <laughs> wow. So um, that's, that's, you know, that's one place, perhaps the main place. Um, but you can also uh, ex you know, ancestor.com. I don't want to give them a plug, but uh, they've got a, a huge database. And then there's a free one, uh, family search, uh, a good, um, in, I'm trying to recall uh, if there's anything I'm leaving out. And just breach, just get on the com just get on the computer, and just start searching. And Were there stories in the newspapers 
um, about the Buffalo Soldiers during that time period? It's interesting that you uh, you 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 asked that question because in Galveston, for example, during the reading of General Order Number Three by uh, Major uh, uh, Granger, uh, Major General Granger, rather, um, they um, we we actually requested information from the Galveston newspaper, and they didn't have anything that we could use in terms of specifics. Oh, uh, there was little written about them uh, during that period. Um, we received a lot of information from uh, from Illinois regarding uh, the USCT unit that they were celebrating and have been celebrating since that time. We didn't know anything about it hmm. because if you're aware that uh, if you you know if you've been keeping up with the with the Juneteenth celebration, it's now spread it. Uh, throughout the country just about and uh, there's a movement um, underfoot that they are going to try and and make it a national holiday but um, <clears throat> but I don't know if that'll happen but I, it's being talked about very strongly <laughs> Wow so What kind of outreach work or educational work does the museum engage in? Oh, good. Good question. <laughs> the um, not only do we we're not just a museum. We're we're like a community hub center, um, and we have space that we you can host meetings. Um, we have the founders room, the the board the the board room. Uh, they can hold up to seventy five people. You can rent with reasonable rental rates. Um, the, we have a large auditorium area where we can hold weddings, uh, banquets, uh, fan reunions, dances, <clears throat> you name it, it's enough space. It would hold 500 people. And it's uh, the building that we're in was built in 1924 by the Houston Light Guard. The Houston Light Guard was the first uh, militia to be formed after the Civil War in Texas. <clears throat> And um, they, um, they were a drill team oriented type of a unit. You know, they competed in different drill competitions around the country. And apparently they were pretty good <clears throat> because uh, they, with their prize money they earned, they built the building that we're in right now. <clears throat> and, uh, and when we uh, obtained the building, it came with this historical memorabilia uh, the uniforms. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, uh, I mean, the building is a historical building in its own rights. And the mayors, uh, we've had three mayors, they thought it was a perfect match. We get a lot of support in Houston. We, we, our name recognition is very good here. So, but getting back to some of the things that we do, and see, we do so many things. I wanted to make sure I list the most important ones. Um, but you know we have we hold educational uh, uh, seminars. Uh, we have a youth program. In fact, one of our active programs that we're getting ready for, if not for the pandemic. Oh, excuse me. All right. That's okay. <laughs> All right, getting away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're we're in the process of uh, of uh, trying to get our inner city uh, youth exploration program uh, off the ground for this year. Uh, it will feature uh, in taking kids out to the historical forts and and hiking, camping. Uh, we have an excellent rapport with the the Texas Park and Wildlife Department. In fact, uh, they awarded us a grant uh, to implement the exploration program. And so, uh, and this is about our third or fourth one with them. Uh, and incidentally, the state of Texas within the Texas Park and Wildlife Department, they also have a Buffalo Soldier uh, Division. <clears throat> and they travel around the state and, and, and do what we do for free. <laughs> but, uh, but we know all those guys, they're, they're outstanding and they do a very good job. They're 
uh, one of our closest partners. <clears throat> okay, also, um, let's see, we, uh, politicians are in and out of the building constantly. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we come with them. Uh, one person, <laughs> one person uh, help Whitman, she wanted to ask a question to you. And I don't know if this is the best question to ask you. It might be better for the next show, but you might know something about it. She says um, she wondered why some USCT soldiers had aliases. She said her grandfather served and mm -hmm. believed his brother, and they both had an alias. So did that alias, I guess, move over into, you know, the Buffalo Soldiers mm -hmm. or from USCT? I know that's a good question. I I can't answer that. I um, okay. I, it's for I, next week. <laughs> I, you know, military people like to like to give uh, handles and. Uh, I know my first when I went on acting duty as a second lieutenant, uh, my battalion commander called me Chuck. <laughs> and wow. I around, I said, um, he said, Chuck, you old Chuck. And I became Chuck. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, it's funny, it's followed me all the way through the military. You know, <laughs> yeah, military love handles, you know, so. Until you became the major. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. I don't know if you necessarily will be able to answer this question either, but the men who served, did they tend, what, considering they were coming from all over the country, mm -hmm. did they tend to remain where they served or did they serve, muster out, and then go back to, to where they came from originally? Most of them would muster out and, and, and go back to where they came from originally, but we had you know, we had a lot of uh, uh, black soldiers remain uh, in the state. <clears throat> uh, you know, Texas was big uh, for cowboys, and we had the surge of the black cowboy uh, along about that time, probably around the 1870s. And, um, you know, I think they said about 20% of the cowboys in Texas during that time period were African American. And uh, and we you know we know that between 18, uh, 1869 and the eighteen nineties that um, the black cavalry represented twenty percent of the uh, you know of the country's cavalry units. Wow! So did they have any? Um, did they do anything on the Hawaiian Islands? That question was asked by Philly by, by Philip Logan. Say that again. Did the did the Buffalo Soldiers have anything to do with the Hawaiian on the Hawaiian Islands? Uh, no, the Philippines they did, and in the Spanish American War uh, in Cuba, uh, they also participated in the Bo Boxer Rebellion uh, in China. Uh, let's see, where is World War One, World War Two? I mean, <clears throat> they've been there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Again, their the work outside of the states, I would be really curious to find out how they how they were received. Just that before the, the show started, I was talking about, again, my, my great uncle, well, my two times great uncle, Crockett mm -hmm. Sheffield, who did serve in the Philippines, and mm -hmm. it looked like he stayed there. Um, and I was just curious what you were saying, you know, they served in China, they served in Cuba, they were in the Philippines. What did those, what did those people make of them? Oh, I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say, actually, um, you know, without accounts from, you know, those who were actually present, uh, because, you know, they were uh, a military organization and <laughs> uh, they were they were there to, to do a job. So uh, I'm not really familiar with with how the, you know, the the people uh, of those countries, you know, that where they fought at. Uh, um, I wish that we we will get some information uh, later on that you know will give us an idea how they were received. But uh, but in times of war and battles, well, I tell you, you know, <clears throat> there there's not too too many you know receptive people there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but again, I guess picking up of what Donnie was saying earlier in the show, again, it's it's the military kind of treating their enlisted men in, in a very different way than the American population were. Because if you're a serviceman, 
and you're being stationed abroad, that means that your commanders, that, that line of command trusts you, that you know how to conduct yourself, that you're gonna, you know, that you're representing your country abroad. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's true. Um, I think the, 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 um, the African-American soldier was very, um, very patriotic, we'll put it like that. Uh, they took the soldiering very, you know, like a duck to water. Um, it, and they did, and they they didn't let all of the the discrimination and the things that were going on of that during that period uh, get in the way. They were determined to be successful, and I think they accomplished that. Well, one person said, "Winners of the West," a campaign newspaper in St. Joseph, Missouri, for um, for veterans of that period ran articles. So there is, there's one in Missouri. <laughs> Missouri. <laughs> yeah, okay. in St. Joseph, Missouri. Okay, all right. So that brings us to really the, the top of the hour, the top of the show. Donia, are there any, is there one more question? Um. Yes, there is one more question. And that question is, where did it go? Okay. It was for Hamad Assad. He wanted to know why did the Native Americans and the Buffalo soldiers fight each other? <laughs> if you can answer that like really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Just a brief well, I, I, yeah, that's, that's an easy one. Uh, the Buffalo soldiers were soldiers. I mean, they were, you know, they were professional soldiers. And they had a job to do, and they did it. Um, the, uh, the one thing I can say that the Buffalo Soldiers were never involved in a massacre of Native Americans, not at all, not during the entire period they were they were out there. <clears throat> wow! And, and we know that that did happen in yeah during that period, but it uh, it wasn't any one of the historical Buffalo Soldier units. Now, there are some uh, Native American tribes that, that take offense uh, to, uh, you know, to the Buffalo soldiers because they think, you know, that they were part of the problem. <laughs> you know, they were being forced to stay on uh, reservations and, you know, Buffalo soldiers, especially the 24th and the 25th regiments, you know, were garrisoned uh, close to reservations and, protected uh, Native American on the reservations from poachers. And and um, there was a group that tried to move in uh, into the reservation and, and, and you know, uh, as settlers and, uh, and settle and Buffalo soldiers would come and run them out of there. <laughs> they, you know, they keep, you know, to keep the peace because you still had a lot of encroachment. They did, you know, they didn't respect the treaties that were made and, and so that made it difficult, you know, for, right. for the cavalry period. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us um, today. This was a very enlightening and just an awesome show. I learned a lot that I, I didn't know. And it just saddens me that this information isn't in um, history books. It's not in the history books. And, uh, and I think that's that's one of the things that drew me to the history but um, but Captain Matthews has done a masterful job in in putting the museum together, and as well as his board of directors, they have a fine group of board of directors too. Uh, so I want to take the time to invite Brian, you, and Donya come down and see what it's all about. <laughs> we will. You. We will. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> And if there's a web, we'll get in all, you know, all of the pertinent information and we'll put it on the um, comment so that people who are in Texas, because we actually have a lot of family in Texas. Do you and, really? Um, okay. Yeah. And we'll be able to share that information. So, Brian, do you want to tell them, give them a brief of what's coming up next week? Unfortunately, we are out of time. So, that, as usual, you can find that on our, on our event feed, but... Trooper Williams, thank you so much for joining us on the show, dropping your knowledge, being so generous with your time. All of you at home, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. You guys have a great Sunday and stay warm. Bye, guys. Have a great one. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>